I want to welcome you here to New Day today, and I am so thankful that you guys are here and that we get to worship today together uh, in this way. Uh, this sermon for me today is, I think, very uh, meaningful for me personally. Um, a lot of things I've been thinking about, honestly, for, for a while now, before even this week and everything happening in the world, and I, I hope that it really blesses you today. But as I start, let me start with a story. When I was in college, uh, I used to love playing flag football uh, because I'm not very strong, so I like the flag football, not the real football, you know? And uh, so I used to play flag football, and um, this one time I was playing, and um, I was going out for a pass. I was playing wide receiver, and I went out for a pass, and the quarterback threw the ball to me, and he threw it kind of high, so I had to kind of jump up high to catch the ball. But uh, don't worry, I caught the ball, you know, I just want you to know that. Um, caught the ball. But when I came back down, the guy that was guarding me, something happened, and he kind of tripped, and so he kind of fell behind me. And so when I caught the ball, whenever I came back down, somehow he was behind me. And instead of landing on my feet, like my feet got kicked out from behind me, and I fell like on my lower back on the ground, and I whiplashed my head like really hard. And I don't think I necessarily blacked out per se, but I think I did maybe black out for a brief second. I know for sure I felt really dizzy, but I got up and I finished the game and everything seemed kind of normal, like I was able to finish the game. But then on my way back from the game, I was walking back to my dorm with uh, my roommate and my really good friend. And the way that he recounts it was, I just started saying a lot of really weird kind of things that I would not normally say. I started saying weird things and I, and I was like not remembering certain things that I clearly knew. And he could tell something was off. And then we got back to our dorm. And I, it's so weird because I remember doing this. And I remember thinking that it was weird that I was doing this, but I was still doing this. And so, so stick with me. So like I got back and I get on Facebook and on social media. And I start messaging a bunch of people like on social media saying really weird things, right? And I thought it was weird, but I was still doing it. And so it was this really weird thing. And like my mind was like all over the place. And then when it got really crazy was we decided we wanted to get some food, so we went to Chick-fil-A. And as we were leaving the dorm and walking outside, I got this really weird, like, fear, almost like a paranoia that somebody was trying to come and, like, capture me when we walked outside. It was really weird. And then we went to Chick-fil-A, and it happened again when we were in the restaurant. I, I felt like somebody was trying to come, like, kidnap me or something. And at that point, I was like, okay, something is a little bit off. And so I called my mommy, and I said, Mommy, I was in college, Mommy, I need you to come get me, and I need you to take me to the doctor because something is off with my mind, and I don't know what it is. And so she got me, and she took me to the doctor, and the doctor um, diagnosed me with a legitimate concussion. Like, I had actually gotten a concussion from falling and hitting my head, y'all, and it was the craziest experience. And when I had that, it was the only time I've ever had anything like that happen in my life. But I learned two things. One was it, it really showed me how often we take for granted our mind and our brain and how, how important it is for those to be healthy for us to like function in this life. But the second thing that I took away from it was just honestly like the, the trippy experience where I can't explain it, but it was almost like half of my mind was right and half of my mind was off. Like, I, I was fully aware, and I remember so much of it, but at the same time, like, my mind was wanting me to do things maybe that I didn't want to do, or I was forgetting things that I knew that I knew. And I say that because I think that's a really good way to describe how a lot of us feel right now in our minds, right? And so I want to talk to you today about winning the battle in your mind, because I can't imagine what's happening in your mind right now and the thoughts that you're thinking with everything that's happening in the world, right? Maybe you're thriving. Maybe you're, you're just thinking nothing but positive, good, godly thoughts. You're full of so much radical faith and you trust God with everything. You're just so positive and optimistic and it's amazing. But for most of us, like I, I know right now you are struggling in your thought life. You've got worries. You've got fears. For some of you, maybe it feels like your mind is like the, just like this constant battle of like negativity, negativity or like worst case scenarios. You see, it's funny, we're living in a day where mental health is skyrocketing. And that was before the coronavirus and the racial tensions and the failing economy. So if mental health was skyrocketing before that, can you imagine what's happening right now in people in this world. 
And I know that we're feeling all of that too. There's this battle that's happening in our minds. And, you know, I talked to so many people, and maybe you can relate with this. And I talked to them, and, and they kind of say, you know what, my mind just kind of holds me back in life. It's like almost one of the worst parts about me. And so it's like, you know, maybe I give off this image of having it all together and I act like I'm at peace and I act like things are good. But like, honestly, in my mind, that's not how I feel. That like our mind is like this thing we're constantly trying to overcome in our life. We act like we have it together. We act like we trust the Lord. But then we've got all these thoughts in our minds that nobody even knows about because we don't really open up about that. We've got all these things in our mind and, and it kind of feels like if we're honest, Maybe our mind is just like the worst part about us and, you know, I just got to deal with it and just kind of let it be. And, and then, man, man, my mind is just so extremely flawed. And yet I have good news for you today, and I bet maybe you've never even thought about this possibly. I want to offer you a couple of verses from God's Word today that I really believe will bless you tremendously. Because I think it's going to change the way you think about how you think. See, the Bible is clear that your mind is not supposed to be the worst part about you, but that actually your mind is something that God has given you and blessed you with as a tremendous gift in your life. That your mind is actually a gift from God to you for your good. Though it is damaged by sin, it, it is, but its purpose nonetheless has not changed. That your mind is designed by God to you to be a strength and not a weakness, to be an asset and not a liability, that your mind is actually the thing that's meant to bring you peace when you feel those feelings of worry, that your mind is actually supposed to be the thing that propels you into your future and not just keeps you stuck in your past. See, your mind is a great gift. It's actually meant to bring you through a lot of the things that you struggle with. But the problem is we often don't realize this. Your mind is amazing, but you don't realize often how amazing it is. I looked at some really cool brain facts this week. And did you know that your mind is actually more active when you're asleep than when you're awake? Like, I love that. Like, your mind, like, does its own thing. That's so cool. Another one is that it's a myth. You heard, like, if you, raise your hand if you ever heard, like, we only use 10% of our brain. Ra raise your hand if you heard that, Okay. That's just not true. That was just like on a Hollywood movie probably once and, and people just started believing it was fact. It's not true. You actually use most of your mind. Did you know that exercise is just as good scientifically, if not better for uh, your mind than it is for your body? So when you exercise, the thing that, Im that Im gets impacted the most is actually your brain, though your body is uh, impacted well as well. The brain also cannot feel pain. Your brain cannot feel pain. And here's another one. This is maybe the coolest thing I think. Though age takes its toll, someone's got to hear this today. Though age does take its toll on our brain, your mind can always get stronger. And at any age, you can always produce new neurons that improve memory and alertness. So praise God for that. Right? I'm 31. I start, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling like the downward thing happening right now, right? But here's the coolest fact right here. Your brain from birth contains 100 billion neurons. You might not even know what a neuron is, but the fact that you have 100 billion of them in your mind is pretty amazing. A neuron is a nerve cell that can send and receive signals through your body and through your consciousness, and they are doing so at all times. So at all times in your life, you have 100 billion nerve cells that are receiving and sending signals all throughout your body. And maybe it's just me, but I don't think that God gave us 100 billion neurons for our mind to be the thing that just constantly holds us back in life. I want to read you a verse today. If you have your Bible, turn me to Romans 12, verse 2. I want to go deep on these verses today. So we're only going to look at two verses today. The first one is Romans 12, verse 2. This is not our main verse for today, but this is the verse that's going to set us up for our main idea today. In Romans 12, 2, Paul is writing to a, a church, and he's really kind of investing in their sanctification and in their growth. And he says this in Romans 12, verse 2. He says, do not be conformed to this world. Other translations say, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good 
and acceptable and perfect. I love that verse because what he says is as our mind is renewed in the word of God and the ways of Christ, we begin to know what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. Now, let me read to you what it does not say. That be, that be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is bad, unacceptable, and imperfect. I love sometimes when you read Bible verses the opposite way of what it says, and then you find out you read it the opposite way. That's actually how I kind of live. <laughs> you ever done that? Oh, I actually do the opposite of what this verse says. He says that whenever your mind is transformed and, and renewed in the ways of the Lord, that then you, be, you get this thing called discernment and you test and you begin to know what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. So when our mind is renewed, and we're going to talk about what that looks like today, it actually leads you in the direction of the will of God for your life. That when your mind is renewed, it actually leads you towards good and acceptable things and perfection, which is God himself. And yet maybe you're like me, and so often your mind leads you in the opposite direction of those kinds of things. But what Paul says is that our minds and the renewal of our minds are this tremendous gift from God to lead us into our future. That what if actually your mind was a thing that was supposed to bring you peace? And not keep you far from peace because you can't shut your mind off or you can't stop thinking about all the things that worry you. But here's the problem. And here's where we're going to start diving in deep today. But your mind must be renewed. That's the critical part. That right here in this verse, what we see is that what it means to be a follower of Jesus is it's like this lifelong journey of the renewal of your mind. And so no matter who you are, how long you've been a Christian today, where you're at in your journey, this is constantly going on in your life. So all of us here, we come here today at the feet of Jesus, and, and all of us are desperately asking Jesus to renew our mind more and more and more and more. We're, we're begging that he do that. And what's interesting is so often we see everything else in life as something that's a gift from God to cultivate for good purposes, except our mind. And so, like, if you have a talent or an ability, it's like, okay, that's a gift from God. You've got to develop it, right? You, you've got to develop the talents and abilities God has given you. Physical health is like this, right? Like, your physical health. Like, we all know, it's no secret or mystery, that if, you know, if, if this coming year, if you eat a good diet and you regularly exercise, you will, in almost every situation, be healthier a year from now physically than you are right now. And we also know that if we don't do those things, it's, it's kind of on us as to why we're not in good physical health. Your money is like this. We talk about this a lot in the church, that God gives us our money and we're stewards of money. We cultivate our money and finances by, by working jobs, by investing money. We have this clear sense that kind of what happens in our financial life is dictated by what we do in this life. Another one that I'm thinking about a lot in this season, especially having young kids, is like how clean my house is, you know? And I think most of us, like, we, we kind of know that, like, if people come over and our house is a wreck, it, like, reflects on us. And we can say it doesn't and that people don't care, but we just know deep down that it says something about us. And, like, when someone comes over your house and it's a, it's a wreck, you can't say, like, well, I can't help it, you know? It's like, no, no, you could have picked up the shoes and the Cheetos, and you could buy yourself a, sw a Swiffer for 20 bucks and clean the floors. Like, you could do that. And so we have this clear sense of so many things in our lives that are to be cultivated, but for some reason, when it comes to our mind, I don't think we think like that. And yet there is so much good for us when we can really begin to see our mind the same way we see so many other gifts from God. See, I think a lot of people see the mind as like concrete. I don't know if you've ever seen the concrete work being done, but they bring the big truck and it's got the thing like uh, circling in the background. And, and it, it's because if the concrete sets or, or, or stays still, it'll set right there. So the, the truck is coming and it's, it's moving and then eventually they, they pour the concrete out of the truck. And there's a, there's a window in time where you can kind of shape the concrete to what you want to make it. But eventually, as you know, once the concrete is set, if you change that concrete, you have to literally break it. And that's how a lot of us see the mind, I think. 
that maybe when you're first born and you're young, you know, you're kind of impressionable. Your mind and your perception can be formed. And there's a season of life where maybe you're kind of able to be formed, but kind of eventually things kind of set in in your mind and you're just kind of the way that you are. And your mind just kind of is the way that it is. And though we might not cure all things in life and people might go through life with things like depression and anxiety and different mental health problems, no matter where we are or what we deal with, the Bible is clear that our minds can be renewed and moved towards Christ. So no matter where you're at, there is hope and there is growth in this life until the day when all things are new with Christ forever. There's so much hope. And so unlike concrete, the Bible describes your mind more like a garden. A garden that we cultivate every single day. A garden where we're constantly removing the weeds and planting good seeds. And so I want to invite you into this today. And I want to give you one verse. You have the Bible. Turn to Philippians 4, verse 8 right now. So Romans 12, verse 2 kind of sets the foundation, if you will. But Philippians 4, verse 8, I think is one of the great practical verses in the Bible that's so clear, that's why I love it, that helps us know how we do this. How do we win the battle in the mind? One of the things that Paul tells us is Philippians 4 verse 8. This is a big process of the renewal of the mind. Paul writes this to a different church as he's finishing up a letter that he's writing to them and he says, finally brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, he says, think about these things. Think about these things. So if you're taking notes today in terms of how do we find the renewal of our mind, write this down. It's really simple. Find the good. And it's so funny, and I, and I, love, I love talking to people about the Christian life because so often the problem in the Christian life is not that we don't know what to do. The problem is we just don't actually do it. And so we might say, well, John, I know that. I know, I know. think about good things. I get that. But do you do it? See, the Christian life is a life about repentance, it's about looking at our life and like not just showing up to church because it's a good thing to do. We kind of get it in and we, okay, I'm a good Christian. You know, we, we come to church to change and to give our lives to Jesus and to repent because God has a better life for us every single day than the life that we're currently living in that moment. And so I want to invite you not out of uh, condemnation because there's no condemnation in Christ, not, not out of shame, but out of love for you and God's plan for you. That in this moment, if you're like, man, I've not been doing this. I want to encourage you to literally repent. Confess to God, I've been way too negative and, and way too ungrateful. I've literally been doing that. God, change me. I'm coming towards you. I'm going to do this week what you tell me to do and not what I think or what someone else tells me. God, God, I'm going to follow you in all things. And so Paul says, literally, find the good. And I love this because this passage, whatever is good, whatever is true, if there's anything excellent, think about these things. This comes right after Paul talks about worry and anxiety. And so he talks about praying to God when we feel anxious or worried in this life. And then he tops it off, meaning like this is what's going to keep you in that place, he says, by finding the good. That word whatever that he uses um, it means consider all things and the, like look out into the world, okay? Take into account everything that you see, he says, and then whatever is true, honorable, just, good, he says, find those things and then think about those things. Every summer, my, uh, my family goes to Destin, Florida. We love it. We just got back from our trip this uh, this uh, year, and um, I wish it was five times as long, but, but it wasn't, you know. I can't afford that. So um, we just got back from Destin this year, and we went last year, actually. And um, last year, we had this moment where we were heading there, and uh, we made a pit stop to get some gas, like a Bucky's or something, halfway through our trip. 
And uh, we went to Bucky's, and we have this philosophy. We're like, since we, especially when you have little kids and you travel with them, you got to keep going. Keep going. Keep driving. Don't stop for a long time. Keep going, 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 going. Just get in the car, get in the freeway, and go, okay? Because you don't think about it, you'll, like, just, you know, not be in a good place. Just go, go, go. So we make pit stops really quick usually. And so we stopped. We got gas. We got back in the car. We hopped back on the highway. We kept going. And about maybe uh, 15 to 20 minutes into getting back on the freeway, we were about halfway there at that point, I began to have this weird sense that, like, I feel like we've seen a lot of this stuff before, <laughs> you know? You know, and, and it's hard out there because everything kind of looks the same, you know? Like, it's just road and grass and random houses and a bunch of subways and McDonald's. Like, I don't know why Subway and McDonald's just, like, own, like, country roads or everywhere. And eventually I asked my wife, because she was navigating, I'm going to throw her under the bus, um, hey, baby, like, I, just check in. Are we going the right way? And she's like, of course we're going the right way. And she gets on her phone and checks just to be sure. And then she's like, uh, uh-oh. <laughs> and so we had actually, we got back in the fruit, but we went back the wrong direction, literally 20 miles the wrong direction. So we went 20 miles the wrong way. So we had to go 20 miles the complete opposite way, the right way. So it took us 40 miles just to get back to where we started originally. And I wish I could tell you that I was keeping the fruits of the Spirit in that, but I was really upset and I was really frustrated. And I have thus since repented. But we were going the wrong way. And the reason why I say that is because Paul says this, because he's making sure your mind is going the right way. And I bet in a time like this, with everything happening in the world, it's really easy for your mind to go the wrong way. It's easy for your mind to go in the opposite direction. And yet Paul says, whatever is true... Like, let's not brush over that. Whatever is true. See, if you're like me, maybe you're tempted to watch a lot of news, to be on social media a lot more than you should. Maybe we're tempted to really take deeply the opinions of others, maybe even our own fear. But we know those things aren't fully true, we know they're flawed. And so though it's good to consider those things, those are ultimately not where we are to direct our attention mainly. The Bible is true. And God gave us his word in written form because, listen, when you want to be clear, what do you do? You write it down. The Bible is true, and so our minds should be drawn to the Word of God. They should be thinking about the Word of God, and not all these things that consume our minds, but many of them are untrue. He says, whatever is honorable, think about these things, meaning an example to be followed, a pursuit to be highlighted for its virtue. I love this one. He says, whatever is just. There's a lot of injustice in the world right now, and there always is. There's, there's a lot of problems. And yet what I think is so cool, I love uh, studying Martin Luther King. I love studying historical figures. And uh, if you've never done it, I want to encourage you sometime to actually like, either look it up, you can read it, or, or go listen to like, the I Have a Dream speech by Martin Luther King Jr. And what's amazing is of all of the speeches that he ever gave, that is undeniably his most well-known speech ever. I have a dream. I love it. He says, I have a dream when kids will be judged not by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. And I find it interesting that his most well-known speech that he ever gave was the one that painted a beautiful vision of a good future. There's something about whenever we focus on what is just, that it's okay to address what is unjust, but when we focus on what is just, somehow it grips us, like that speech grips us, and somehow it pulls us forward. He says, whatever is pure, meaning without sin, moving us in the direction of God's nature, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, whatever is excellent, Whatever is worthy of praise, God's work, his redemption, his nature. See, we must find the good, especially in this season, because listen, you, you cannot go where you do not see. 
You, you can't go somewhere if you don't see it in order to get there. And so often, I, it's, you know, psychology always takes credit for everything in the Bible. They talk about how you have to like visualize it and see it in your mind before it becomes a reality. And, and once again, I mean, I don't, I don't fully buy into that thinking in every single way. But, but there's something to this idea that like, how in the world are we going to go somewhere if we don't know what it would look like to know what we have to do in order to get to that place? Now, I want to be clear. This does not mean that we ignore negative or bad things in our life. I want to be really clear about that. This is not like a fake positivity. This isn't just like, you know, everything's falling apart. I'm so happy, you know. Like, it's not like a fake positivity. I think a great example of this is John 17 when Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane before he's crucified. Um, like, he's in pain, right? He, he doesn't, I mean, he wants to go to the cross, but he doesn't want to bear that pain. I mean, it's a very intense thing. He's fully God, but he's also fully man. And so he's fully man so he can be our substitute on the cross. But what that means is that this is very real pain that he's experiencing. And Jesus goes to the Father and and he says, my soul is in anguish within me. He's like, I am in pain and and I'm telling the Father this. But notice he brings it to the Father. He brings it to the Father. He processes it with the Father He works through it to where by the end of it, he says, but not my will, but your will be done. That where we do have negative thoughts or anxieties or things we're struggling with in our mind, that ultimately we bring those things to God. We lay them at his feet. We process the pain and the bad things, but we're always looking for the good. We're always filling our minds with the word and the good. Because the Bible is honest that there is pain and sin and problems in this world. But listen, the Bible is clear. There is so much good in this world. And I want to declare this over you right now because CNN will not declare this over you and Fox News will not declare this over you. God is at work in your life. Let that sink in. God is at work in your life. God is powerfully at work in your life. He's at work in my life in this season. I love that famous John Piper quote that says, at any given moment, God's doing a billion good things in your life, and you might be aware of three of those things. That God is at work in your life. That God is still providing you every single thing that you need. That in this season, God is maturing you in your faith and in your obedience. That God is at work in your life. There's so many difficult things right now, but a really good example of this is as recently as many of you know, someone in our community, my sister, Amy Horner, her husband Evan, um, their, their uh, new baby son was born with a heart defect. And we've been working through that and praying for them and lifting up to the Lord. But uh, someone started a GoFundMe account for them. And within, I think, like two days, like we raised $10,000 for them to cover all of the medical expenses on their behalf. And I was talking to Evan, my brother-in-law, a couple Sundays ago after church, and he was like, man, it's just such a weight off of my shoulders that, that that's covered. I mean, there's enough to deal with without the financial reality of this. And I'm just blown away how in the midst of a very difficult moment, there's good in it. And the same is true for our lives. People often say perception is reality, but that's not true. Perception is perception, and reality is reality. And what I would tell you is don't let your perception rob you of reality. Because reality is good. Your perception might be skewed. Your your perception might be skewed by somebody who maybe doesn't believe in God's redemption in the end, and so they're terrified in this world right now because this life is all that they have. And so they're freaking out, you know. The worst thing that could happen is is they think they would die. That's the worst thing. And so, yeah, like from that worldview, that would really stink, you know. And and they're creating that fear and anxiety, and we just begin absorbing that from people. But it's because they don't have a worldview that has any hope in it. It's because they have a perception that's not in line with reality because the word of God is reality. The word of God, as you read earlier in Isaiah, is a thing that stands in the end. You see, when you see good, you see the future, church. 
When you see good, you see the future. When you see bad, that's not, when you see bad, that's a temporary thing, the Bible says. When you see good, you see the future because God is making all things new. And so we find the good. But then here's the main thing right here. We find the good. And, and this last part, I promise you, it's going to sound so basic, but, but I really want to go deep on this because I don't think that we often do this. Just look at the very end of verse 8. It says, whatever is true, honorable, whatever is commendable, any excellent. So we're, we have this proclivity to pursue the good, to think about the good. We're trying to go in that direction every day when we wake up. But then he says this. Think about these Things, he says. Think about these things. So second thing is this. Focus on the good. So you find the good, but then you have to focus on that good. We said earlier that our mind is an amazing gift from God for good. And the ability to focus is, I mean, we take it for granted, but that's an amazing ability that our mind has. But I want to lay before you a problem I think that all of us are facing right now. The reality is, is that social media, the internet, and this new digital world that we're living in is literally and scientifically ruining our ability to focus. There's a book that I read that I recommend if you're interested in stuff like this uh, called The Shallows, written by Nicholas Carr. And what's kind of crazy about this is he wrote this before social media became a really big thing and, and, and right when the, the smartphone was coming out. So this is just with like the internet in general. And he wrote this book out of his own life. He's a researcher. And, and what he realized was he... he he was having a hard time focusing on things, like being able to sit down and focus for an extended period of time on one thing. And he had this weird sneaking suspicion that maybe just the internet and how, it was, how he was processing information in that way was kind of doing that to him. So he began to research it, and what he began to find was it's, it's very clear scientifically that um, the way that we process information via the internet and social media and all these things, it's ruining our ability to focus because... The way that it's set up, because think about it, the internet is like all the world's information that's like ever existed, and you can access all of it. Like there was a time, I know it's crazy, where the internet didn't exist, and like if you wanted to know something, what you would maybe go out of your house to the library to check out one book on one topic and one thing, and you would think about that, but now you can Wikipedia like anything, anytime. Like, all, like, like we have all of the world's information available to us. And so what happens then is we don't really focus anymore. We're kind of like this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing. And so that's what social media does to you. So you have your phone and look this up for yourself and think about it. Like you're on your phone or you're on social media and you're like this person, this picture, this picture, like that, don't like that. Let me comment this, this, this. And you're, you're basically training your mind to go from thing to 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 thing. And, and your mind kind of likes it because it kind of gives like a dopamine of something new, something new, something new, something new, something new, something new. But the reality is, is that what that does is you're actually training your brain to operate that way. There's a term called neuroplasticity, which people are saying is like the biggest discovery in brain science in the last two decades. Neuroplasticity, if you don't know what it is, is this idea that our brain is always shifting and reshaping itself. Once again, it's a garden, not concrete, remember? Your brain is always reshaping itself based on how you use it. And so the same way that your body, like, you know, whenever you lift weights, you know, which you can tell I don't do a lot of, but whenever you lift weights, right, your, your body notices that it says, oh, oh, we're using these muscles a lot. And so your, your body actually works to build muscle in those places. It's amazing. But your brain is the same way. And so it's like the way that you use it becomes the way that your brain naturally wants to operate. And so what, what is happening in, in this moment in time, and once again, I'm, I'm for these things. I think they're good. I don't think you should necessarily not be on social media or the internet or things like that. But what we have to be mindful of is that those things are literally changing the way that our brains are, specifically our ability to focus on things. And the reason I say that is because in Philippians 4, verse 8, the Greek word that Paul uses when he says to think about is logizomai. And that word means to take into account carefully, or it means to ponder. And we have to be careful when we translate words, because in our language, when we hear think, oh, think about it. Okay, think about an elephant. Okay, I did. Now I'm on to the next thing, right? When we hear the word think, we're kind of a casual culture. So we think, oh, I just thought about it really quick. 
I thought about it. Yeah, I thought about an elephant. Like right now, you're probably thinking about an elephant. That's cool. But that's not what Paul is talking about when he's talking here. Paul is using a word logizomai, which means to take into account carefully and to ponder. And so what Paul is saying is that the way that we renew our mind, the way that we have the right perception that is in accordance with reality, is that we are in things like the word of God, that, that we're uh, finding what is good, what is true, what is reflective of the kingdom, and we're pondering those things. We're taking deeply into account those things. And so if you're going to write down one more thing today, write down this. How do you win the battle in your mind based upon what we're reading today? This is it. You go deep with God and the good. You go deep with God and the good. See, what I think it requires of us today as, as Christians is we have this weird thing, and I've always felt this tension between like doing things in life and like trusting God. Like to me, there's a huge tension between like trying hard and trusting God, and I'm always in that place. And, and the, the reality is, is that scripture, we're called to be very practical. Like we actually do things in the world and love people, but the reality is we're also called to be mystics in a sense. That there's a part of us that's real practical, down to earth, but there's also part of us that's like this mystic, like a mystic is someone that kind of like thinks of like the spiritual realities and evaluates, like someone that's okay being, a, like kind of removes some from the world to ponder spiritual truths and the realities of God. But early on in church history, in the 300s and the 400s, there'd be people who would literally forsake life. They would leave everything behind. They would go out into the desert and they would just ponder God for 40, 50, 60 years. They were called the desert fathers. I'm not saying you should do that, though it does sound nice to get a house, you know, outside of Austin in the hill country and just kind of live there and ponder God all of your days, you know. But that what it means to be a follower of Jesus is not just really down-to-earth, basic, work your job, do things, you know, love people, serve people. That, that's very important. But it's also this sense that we're called to be like really deep in spiritual matters and the things of the faith and that we have to be able to remove ourselves from the world to be with God in order to really love the world that we're in. We must go deep with God in the good. And if you're here right now, and man, you're like, man, I just don't do that. <laughs> like, it's hard, like, it's hard for me to pray for five minutes without my mind wandering. And just know if your mind wanders in prayer, like mine too, a lot. I try often every day to meditate on a scripture that, that kind of gives me good perspective in my mind for 10 minutes. And it is the hardest part of my day, but it's also one of the best parts of my day. And I can't explain why that is. But we're in the gospel and so if you're here today, like, and you're like, man, I don't do this. Listen, you, you don't need to waste any of your time feeling bad or shameful. You don't need to waste any of your time getting down to yourself because there's no condemnation for those in Christ. So listen, if this is not you, this is not like, oh, you, I stink, oh, my mind, oh, I'm just being, you know, ruined by social media. No, 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 we don't need to think any of those things because we are covered perfectly in grace. Instead of wasting any time feeling any shame, all we have to do is to begin to walk this direction and begin changing and committing to the renewal of our mind. And if your mind was really at peace and really with Christ, can you imagine how, like, is there anything in your life that would not instantly improve? Your job, your mindset, your anxiety, your mental health, your marriage, your parenting. Your, I, mean, I mean, is there anything that would not be touched in a positive way if we really began to say, I'm going to be more selective about my mind? Some really practical ways we do this is one, just being grateful in prayer, gratitude in prayer. Gratitude is an amazing thing. Practicing gratitude before God, list 20 things you're thankful for. And you're like, man, my life is really good. But it's amazing when you don't think about those things, you don't feel that, you know? Another one that I highly encourage, and I know most Christians don't do, is to learn to meditate on a hopeful Bible verse that encourages you. To meditate means I think on it deeply for like five or ten minutes. And, and then for a lot of us in the tradition that we come from, 
Maybe that, like the idea of meditation on Scripture is not very common. We talk about the Bible and prayer, but man, I was convicted a few years back when I would read through the Psalms, and David, it says, would meditate on the Word. Meditation is not some like Eastern religious kind of thing. Meditation is a biblical concept. It's a gift from God, and meditation means literally to focus. And I'll just say this right now. I have had some experiences in the prayer closet by myself where I have meditated on a verse of scripture and I have felt thrills in my soul far greater than any public gathering I've ever experienced. We have those amazing moments. Like, like those are great moments, but I've had moments in myself where I have meditated on a verse. I'm like, I will not think about anything else for 10 minutes. And when my mind wanders, I'm gonna pull it back. And I've had some thrilling experiences that I almost can't even physically explain. And I think it's because in that moment, I was maybe closer to heaven than I'd ever been because my mind was so absorbed with the truth of the word of God. And I wasn't thinking about, you know, what my Uncle Joe said on Facebook, you know? And I wasn't thinking about, you know, what some commentator said. And I wasn't looking at something else. I was really focused fully on God. That I was experiencing my mind could go farther into God and his word than I previously realized. Another thing we can do to go deep with God and the good is memorize a Bible verse, the lost art, okay? <laughs> the lost art of Bible. I recently picked this up a year ago, um, and I have like a bunch of verses on my phone on notes. I highly encourage you, like find verses that you need to remember, put them on your phone, but, re- but memorize them. Because what does memorizing do? It puts it into your brain. Memorization cements it in your brain. And whatever you memorize, you will think about the most, you're like me, though, a lot of times you memorize your anxieties, you know? You memorize, I, I've heard like we're, we're rehearsing our anxieties. Like, let me just think through all the worst case scenarios and all that would stink, you know? And that's where our mind's at, right? But when you memorize scripture, you begin to put it into your mind and into your subconscious. Another one is being consistent in church, which you guys are already doing. If you'll be here for this, you'll be here for anything. So praise God for you guys. You guys are faithful. Thank, I thank God for you. But be consistent in community. The, the consistent thing I hear for people is whenever they get in a community group, they're like, man, like for some reason there was a resistance to get in, but once I did, it was amazing. I need this. And the last thing is just simply turning off anything that doesn't lift you up. I don't mean that we don't engage. I mean, there's some nuance to what I'm saying in that, but it's almost like me giving you or, or the word giving you the authority to say, listen, I don't have to listen to this. That we do have a responsibility to protect our hearts in this life. We do have a responsibility to protect our minds. And so whether that's like movies or music for you or honestly maybe even like certain people. Like, you know, you can unfollow people on Facebook, right? Like that's the, the, the recent thing I've discovered in this season. Praise God for the unfollow function on Facebook, you know. You can unfollow them. They'll never know. You'll still be friends, you know. You just don't see their stuff all the time, you know. It's like this random friend I had in seventh grade, you know, who's like freaked out, you know, and some reason like I'm thinking about him every day, you know, like what is this? But we have a responsibility to keep our souls. So as we draw to a close today, um, man, I really hope what we're talking about in this moment, I hope this really begins a conversation in yourself. This is not just I listened to, to kind of one sermon and and then I, I got it, and, I, and I'm solid, and, and we're good. Um, this is like a, I'm beginning a conversation. I'm hopefully planting kind of a, a biblical seed in your heart and in your mind that this week you will continue to think about with the Lord. A verse we read earlier, which um, if you're going to memorize a verse this week, I, I highly might recommend it be this verse. Isaiah 26, verse 3, when he says, that you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Isaiah says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And so that's going like Old Testament 3000 years ago The same thing that Paul says in Philippians 4, verse 8, when he says, whatever is true, whatever is good, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, think about these things. 
know, we have to think biblically about our mind. We have to remember in the season that our mind is, is a garden. And so what that's gonna mean when the world is like it is, is that, man, I, I've gotta be a little bit more attentive to it than, than maybe even I normally am. You know, the same way that, you know, people are socially distancing themselves because they don't wanna get the coronavirus. In the same way that we're wearing these, these masks because we don't want the virus to come into our lungs and infect us. That it is important to be physically healthy, but it is much, much more important to be mentally healthy in the Lord. That right now, probably in this world, like what they say, maybe 1% of our population will end up getting the coronavirus. But is it not true that probably 100% of our population is getting mental worry and mental anguish and fear and frustration? That as Christians, let's be wise, let's be discerning, that as we're fighting against this thing, that, that we're not creating new problems. There's a great quote that I wanna finish with from Martin Lloyd-Jones. He was a famous British preacher in the 20th century. <clears throat> and I love this because he talks about um, talking to yourself instead of always listening to yourself. And I think it fits what we're talking about today because a, a big part of what we're talking about is, is really kind of taking responsibility for our mind and our thought life. It's, it's kind of taking the reins because God has given them to us in, in terms of kind of how we're thinking and, and the renewal of our mind. And he says this quote in a book called Spiritual Depression. I love that title. It's called Spiritual Depression, Its Causes and Its Cures. And he wrote this book, he was a pastor, and he wrote this book to it because so many people in his church would claim to be Christians, but they were the most like cranky, unhappy people <laughs> that he had ever met. And he's like, I don't get it. Like you have Christ and you, you're gonna be with him forever. Like, why are you unhappy? And he, and he often called it this thing called Spiritual Depression. And one of the chapters he writes this, it's so good. It says, have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? Take those thoughts that come to you in the moment you wake up in the morning. You have not originated them, but they are talking to you. They bring back the problems of yesterday. You see, somebody is talking, but who is talking to you? The answer is yourself is talking to you. Now this man's treatment in Psalm 42, which was King David, was this. Instead of allowing this self to talk to him, he starts talking to himself. He says, why are thou art cast down, O my soul, he asks. His soul has been depressing him and crushing him. And so he stands up and says, self, listen. For this moment, I will speak to you. And there's a lot of things happening in the world right now. And yet allow me to be merely an imperfect vessel that communicates the truth of God to you. That when your mind is renewed in Christ, you will know the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. I know there's a lot of problems in the world right now, but God is at work in your life. And I know maybe in our mind there's a struggle, but God has renewal for us and a good future for us. And that is more true than anything that anyone says, including maybe you might even be saying to yourself. So I wanna do something today. I'm gonna to invite you to stand up with me this time. And I really want us to deeply be reminded as we finish today that our mind is a garden. And I want this to begin bringing some momentum into your life in terms of understanding that, that we're gonna take responsibility for our minds and our souls and our well being, and that we are gonna to cling to the word of God because it is true and it is perfect. And as we finish today, I just wanna sing this over you that God turns graves into gardens. 
And when I talk to a lot of people, man, they don't, yeah, my mind feels like a grave. But it's a garden. And I pray that today we're removing the, the, the weeds of the world and planting the seeds of Scripture right now. So bow your heads with me. I just want to sing this over you for a little bit, and then we're going to sing this song together. That our God, through His Word and through His Spirit, and all of our imperfections and all of our weaknesses and all the ways that we've been failing, that God brought you here today because He's going to turn your graves into gardens. And let's believe this in our minds. Let's believe His words. We don't have to believe the lies of the world. We don't have to believe the anxieties of the world. We don't have to believe the fears in our hearts. Jesus says, whenever you fear, don't fear. Whenever you're tempted to fear, stop doing that because you have the power, you have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians says. You have the mind of Christ and His power in you. Our brain is powerful and we have far more power over it than we often realize. And we receive that today. We let go of any falsehood, anything that's not true. And we receive this truth today.